So we're on another beautiful cold day. <laughs> it's been cold, but beautiful, cold and sunny. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O. I'm Tony Okwesomi, a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I treat addictions in Maryland. I welcome you tonight to a subject, a topic that when I was given the topic by a speaker, I'm like, what, 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 what are you talking about? So if you had the same reaction as me, I guess stay tuned. Let's see what our speaker, our guest speaker has for us tonight, our very own Dr. Oluwole Ajagwe. The floor is yours, sir. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm sure um, with all the hustles and bustles in preparation for Thanksgiving, uh it's a it's a great uh, privilege to have you join us uh this evening just to talk a dialogue on an issue that we could choose to be ostriches burying our, uh, burying our heads in the sand and pretending not to see the hunter and thinking that the hunter won't see it uh the problem with uh you know, the topic that we're going to address to, you know, this evening, the problem is there, uh, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Uh, the topic tonight is oral health, oral sex, and oral genital infection. Actually, when it was published, it was published as oral sex, oral health, and orogenital infection. But of course I changed it, right? Well, somebody did not like the fact that oral sex came first in the topic and just decided to suggest a rearrangement of the, of the topic. But it's nonetheless, it's still the same. So tonight, I just want to address us, uh, introducing the topic, uh, maybe through dialoguing and exchanges of uh, information, there'll be more things drawn out. Uh, as a disclaimer, uh, I am not selling anything, neither am I trying to buy anything. Uh, this topic is supposed to be for educational purposes and uh, interactions and dialogue. So, when we talk about this topic, I think we should address it uh, systematically. The first thing that we'll look at is what is oral health? If we can define oral health, we can define it simply as a state in which the mouth is healthy. It's as simple as that. There are many features and many structures in the mouth, starting from the lip, all the way to the throat uh, and everything in between will be, you know, will be what we constitute, I mean, what will be, what we describe as the mouth. And uh, scientifically we refer to that as oral. So when you hear the word oral health is actually talking about mouth health. So mouth health uh, will be considered the state in which the lip from the outside and the inside is without any break. There is no chapping of the lip. There is no cracking of the lip. There is no tearing of the lining of the mouth on the lip side because people chew crusty stuff. Uh, when you chew crusty stuff like uh, crackers or Doritos or uh, all those chips, chances are that you're gonna have some tears and cuts of, your, of the linings of the mouth. Uh, maybe not necessarily on the tongue initially, unless you bite your tongue, you generally don't hurt the tongue because of the type of covering that is uh, 
surface of the tongue, you know, has. So when we look at the mouth, there is no break in the continuity of the cover, uh, which is the lining of the mouth, whether it's in the cheek, under the tongue, the floor of the mouth, uh, the roof of the mouth, the uvula, the soft palate, and the uh, is, is the the larynx and the, I mean the pharynx, which is the back in the uh, the back of the mouth that opens into the uh, into the throat. So, if everything there is fine, uh, we look at the teeth. The teeth are fine. There is no cavity. There is no breakage. There is no crack. There is no sharp uh, restorations. Uh, there is no old restorations that need to be refilled. Uh, and everything is the saliva is flowing normally, and there is no dry mouth in situation. Uh, there is no spontaneous uh, ulcerations. There are no blisters. There are no um, signs of infection. There is no bleeding from the gums. There is no loose tooth. All of these are the you know uh, the components that make the mouth healthy. Because when all those things that I described are present, um, you know, if we have gum bleeding or we have tearing of uh, the mucosa, either from chewing or from biting or from injury, all of these are opening the, the mouth up to the uh, uh, infections that could come from outside or could actually come from within is some people do regurgitate their food and uh, sometimes bacteria you know can you know from regurgitated food can actually infect the mouth uh, for some people when they cough up like people who have uh, uh, pneumonia they cough up you know sputum they cough up uh, you know pus from their lungs and if you have tears or cuts in the mouth, those can, you know, those organisms can also infect the uh, cuts and bruises and tears of the mouth. So, when we try to avoid any of those conditions that will make the mouth to be uh, unhealthy or having diseases, then we can say we have uh, excellent or good oral health. Now let's move on to the oral sex. Uh, we, uh, as a disclaimer, we, this is not supposed to be uh, a talk on moral instruction or whether it's a religious uh, front or you know any other front other than for medical purposes to be able to address the uh, potentials for spread of diseases. So when we talk about oral sex, there are three aspects of oral sex as being recognized in the medical field. Now, for those who are, you know, are avid, uh, uh, what I call the customers of pornographic materials, there may be different variations. But for the sake of medicine, there are three uh, different aspects of oral sex that is being recognized and being investigated as research projects in medicine. The first one is what is referred to as fellatio. Fellatio is simply mouth to penis uh, contact. Uh, so if you, if you had the word fellatio and you don't know what it means, it only means that uh, there is a contact between the mouth and the penis uh, the second one is uh, conilingus, which is mouth to vagina uh, contact. And the third one is analingus, which means uh, mouth to anus uh, contact. And that is, the, those are the three uh, components or the three different aspects of oral sex. Now, as you can see, when any any part of our you know uh, mouth touches any part of the perineal area, which is the groin area, uh, the chances of 
spread of infection is very high. And so we're not going to go into the details of what actions goes on during oral sex. But all we want to be able to say is that whatever mode anyone is engaged in, uh, for the sake of discussion, could cause transmission of infection or diseases. So the primary uh, agents of spread uh, or the primary agents that are being spread through this kind of contact will be either bacteria, uh, fungal, or um, viral. And we know that some of these things are very obvious uh, when we see them, and some are not very obvious when they are visible. Uh, so if we Let's quickly just go over the uh, the possible infections. So that moves us to the uh, third aspect of the topic today, the oral genital infection. So let's start from the viruses. The viruses are, th uh, are kind of the commonest ones are the ones that cause blisters, the ones that can lead to um, uh, other kind of uh, irrit irritations and presentations of the genital area, which can then be transmitted to the mouth. Uh, the first one will be the herpes. Uh, herpes simplex, there are two of them. There is this herpes simplex type 1, and there is the herpes simplex type 2. Uh, both herpes uh, variants, you know, can occur either in the mouth or in the genital area. they primarily, the herpes simplex type one occurs in the mouth or in the head and neck area only when there is uh, open ulcers or blisters and in contact with ulcers in the genital area can you find a cross contamination of herpes simplex in the genital area. However, the second type, which is the herpes type 2, is primarily in the genital area. So for anyone to have herpes type 2 in the mouth, it means that it is not that the uh, virus jumped uh, from the, peri I mean, from the uh, perineal area in the air and then infect somebody in the mouth. So there has to have been oral genital contact in order for somebody to have herpes type 2 in their mouth. Now, um, for those who don't know what herpes is, herpes is simply a fever blister uh, caused by the herpes uh, virus, which when it occurs in the mouth uh, in the form of type 1, it is what we find on the corner of the mouth or on the lip uh, whether upper lip or the lower lip, or sometimes it could be just in the corner of the mouth and it will cover both the upper and the lower lip. Uh, when it's there, it comes like tiny, tiny vesicles, uh, tiny uh, fluid-filled vesicles, which occasionally will become crusted or become ulcerated before becoming uh, a crusted. Now, when they are in the blister form or ulcerated form, they are very contagious. So if you touched it and accidentally rub your eye, the chance of you transmitting that to your eye is very high. So the same way, if you have ulcers from the herpes simplex type 1 in the corner of the mouth and you give uh, oral sex to somebody who happened to have ulcer or a break in their skin in the genital area, the chance of contaminating or infecting them is very high as well. Just as simply as you can infect your eye, you can easily infect the genital area as well. Now type 2 uh, also presents similarly uh, like the, the way this type 1 presents in the mouth, but now it's in the, in the uh, genital area. When it presents, it also presents with vesicles, which, is, which quickly become ulcerated. When it becomes ulcerated, it becomes you know, kind of irritated. Uh, and if somebody had sex in, under that condition, uh, the chance of spreading 
the, uh, the virus from whoever has it, who is the host, to somebody who is contacting them, who become the prospective host, if they have means of being contaminated by way of breaking their skin, or maybe they have ulcerations of their skin as well. So uh, that is the first viral infection that can be transmitted either from the mouth to the genital area or from the genital area to the mouth. The next um, um, virus that could be transmitted by, you know, during the time of oral genital contact is uh, the um, HIV. Uh, human immunodeficiency virus has been found and be associated with, uh, uh, you know, cross contamination via body fluid. And when you have uh, unprotected sex, particularly in the mouth, and then you have uh, semen or vagina fluid being contaminated by the viral virus, uh, HIV virus, the chance of contaminating the, the partner is very high. So whether there is um, uh, ulcerations, cuts, or breaks in the lining of the mouth or genital area, it's not too, uh, I mean, does not preclude, if, if you don't have a break in the skin or the lining of the mucosa, does not mean that if you have very high load of virus in the body fluid that you cannot contract HIV, particularly if it's a frequent exposure. So the third one, the third uh, virus that, you know, is being looked at upon when we talk about oral genital uh, contact is the HPV. Uh, HPV is human papilloma, human papilloma virus. Uh, the primary way by which we get that from uh, the genital area to the mouth is through people who have what we describe as venereal warts. Uh, venereal warts is uh, you know, kind of like skin tags, but they occur in the genital area, more in the perineum or around the anal uh, opening. And they are there, they, they, they may be uh, itchy, but generally, most of the time, people that have them don't even know that they have a problem, that something like that occurs. Because it does not look ulcerated, it does not feel uh, irritated or painful. So it can easily be there for years, and be, uh, their partners can be constantly in contact with that, thereby spreading the uh, HPV virus in that, in that fashion. The second kind of uh, HPV, there are many variants of uh, human papilloma virus, but the common one is the one that causes the uh, venereal warts. Um, but there, there is another uh, variant of uh, HPV that actually could cause the cervical cancer which is the reason why women are asked to do pap smear uh, at a certain age and uh, so to screen for the presence of a human papilloma virus that could prevent, I mean, that could present as cancerous changes in the cervix. Um, it's also been proven that hepatitis can be spread uh, through oral genital contact particularly hepatitis A and B, uh, if there is oral genital contact, whether it is uh, in the uh, oral to vagina, oral to penis, or oral to anus, they could be transmitted. Uh, you know, there's care and there is the blood involved. Uh, but, um, hepatitis A doesn't need to be blood borne. It could be transmitted through uh, fecal contamination. So hepatitis C can also be spread through uh, oral genital contamination if there is a break in the skin and there is blood. Uh, for instance, somebody who has bleeding teeth or bleeding gums or who has, uh, you know, uh, 
chair in the mouth. Uh, maybe the chair wasn't there until the uh, you know sexual encounter uh, began, and then the person bleeds in that kind of situation. That for if somebody has hepatitis C, it could be spread to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the partner inadvertently without you know knowing that that is occurring. So um, those are the common viral, there are other viral uh, conditions that those are not very common uh, that we would, you know, that could be transmitted through oral genital contact. The other kind of uh, uh, infection that can be spread through oral genital contact will be bacteria. And that is uh, uh, the first one will be gonorrhea. Uh, we know that that is one of the, um, uh, what you call the sexually transmitted infections. And it seems to be the commonest of the uh, infections. Uh, uh, and this is caused by bacteria that actually cause, uh, you know, pulse formation. And the pulse that is formed can be very foul smelling. And uh, it could present from the male first and be transmitted to the female or it could be uh, you know transmitted from the female to the male uh, or we also know now that you know there is no restriction to the sexual orientation so all kinds of uh, combinations of uh, sexual interactions you know do occur and you know we cannot totally exclude the uh, oral genital contact in such ways. Now, one of the reasons why this topic is very, very important before I go on to uh, talk more about the bacteria infection is the, um, is the, the uh, we don't want to call it a, an epidemic. It is a widespread occurrence of this uh, practice among adolescents. Now, every parent, you know, that has an adolescent, adolescent child or will, will almost swear that their children, is, uh, their children are very, you know, uh, well-mannered. They don't, they don't get into any kind of uh, mischief. In fact, they can swear that their children are not sexually involved. Well, but the studies, the data says the opposite. The data says that there is depending on which part of the uh, country you are in, that there is a range between 14 to 50% of adolescents who are engaged in oral sex. The, re excuse me, the reason they engage in oral sex is because they believe it's safer uh, that they're not gonna get pregnant. And so they would rather do oral sex than, get, than become sexually, uh, in, I mean, active, I mean, talk in terms of uh, uh, whatever combinations they, they want to practice. Um, so that is a big problem. I mean, in every community where you have up to about 50% of adolescents being, I mean, engaging in oral sex. And most of them are not practicing protected sex. So they are very daring and they are constantly doing it. And it's as early as 10 years old, you know? So when we are looking at this, we're not gonna be thinking about, oh, uh, those who are already in high school and all of that. It's getting younger and younger. And the mix between the adolescents and even adults is making it even more complicated. So uh, we cannot afford to ignore the, uh, the seriousness of this matter. And that is why uh, when I raised it up uh, as a topic and uh, got some people raising their eyebrows like, what? Uh, I said, well, let's talk about it first. And then you find out that it is, you know, it is very, very important. Now, another reason why we need to consider this as being very, very important is imagine having a, a child that is always sick, that you are not even thinking about sexually transmitted disease. Because you're looking at the child and say, this child is very young. I mean, I mean how could he have a 
Take care of it, transmit a disease. Well, you do every other thing, but the doctor or pediatrician may not even think because of the way you present the case to your to the pediatrician. They don't even have a you know inclination to look in the area of uh, sexually transmitted disease. And these children can be carrying chlamydia infection, which does not have any visible sign. You don't see it, only they might just be telling you, oh mom, when I'm peeing, it hurts. Well, it hurts. Okay, well, you think maybe they just have UTI. And then you say, okay, well, let's go to your doctor. Maybe you'll see what is happening. They do tests and they're not looking for chlamydia. Unless they do a barrage of, uh, uh, you know, tests and they just cover every base. If they don't cover every base, the chance of missing some of these, uh, you know, uh, obvious causes which are hidden in plain sight is very high. So now the next uh, bacteria that we will consider will be syphilis. Uh, syphilis is, <laughs> is a very silent one because unless you know about syphilis, you will not understand what is going on. Syphilis is, uh, is transmitted by what we call a spiral kit. Uh, of, you know, a, um, a, a type of bacterium that is kind of wavy in shape. And when it goes through the skin, it causes ulceration. And that ulceration is very, very strange. It, it will be usually painless and it will be raised. The borders will be raised and it doesn't have to be very big. But most of the time when it occurs, it occurs in the male genital organ and they don't know that it's anything, you know, serious. They just think, okay, well, it's not hurting. And uh, it will be there, but it is highly contagious. So when you have a male partner who has an ulcer on their genital, and you're gonna put your mouth on it, you better think twice. Uh, unless you find out that that is not syphilis, it, you know, it is more likely that you are dealing with syphilis because it doesn't have to hurt and it will not bleed either unless it is injured. And the ulcer can be there for weeks and it doesn't go away naturally until it is treated. Now, the danger of syphilis is it can become very serious. It can become secondary and it can become tertiary. So when it becomes tertiary, it actually affects the central nervous system. Uh, and it can cause, you know, cause paralysis. And the, the same kind of situation where they describe as paralytic of the insane, they become like they're, they're going crazy and they, their brain is shutting down on them and they feel paralyzed in most cases. So syphilis is very serious. Uh, it needs to be, easy, you know, be recognized and be diagnosed very early. When it is transmitted to the mouth, let's say inadvertently, a, you know, a partner, uh, you know, has oral, um, you know, genital contact, and then there is syphilis that's transmitted from the genital area to the mouth. It actually presents the same way. Like it would in the in the case of the uh, in the male, I mean, in the uh, genital organ, it will be a raised ulcer. I mean, it will be an ulcer with raised border and a central, you know, the, the deep central part, which is kind of necrotic. That central part is where the bacteria that causes syphilis reside, and any contact with that exposes anybody who comes in contact with it, uh, you know, to the organism. And they will, if there is the opportunity, they will develop uh, syphilis themselves. So for instance, if somebody has an ulcer on the tongue and the tongue, get, you know, even though it's not hurting and they are kissing and they are going and having an oral sex, well, they will be transmitting the syphilis uh, regardless of the number of, uh, you know, contacts they do have. So we need to remember that syphilis is a very serious problem uh, that we need to uh, be aware of. And at least if you see something that is suspicious, 
ask for help, take it out first, don't take risks. So sometimes those risks can be very uh, devastating and far reaching, and in some cases may actually be fatal. Uh, well, another um, organism that we will be talking about is chlamydia and amoebiasis. Chlamydia also can affect the genital area. That's the one that I described when we, I was talking about the adolescent that we need to watch out for. Uh, it doesn't have any major visible, I mean, visible sign. Uh, the only sign that seems to be very visible is um, dysuria. When people are peeing and they say they are having burning sensations, uh, and many people who have been carriers of this disease for many years can actually become uh, infertile over, uh, over time because it can affect every part of the female genital organ and causes them to become uh, infertile. Um, then the other, the other organism that we, we could talk about is amoebiasis. Amoeba, which is for those people who are constantly having uh, mouth to anus contact. Well, if somebody has amoebiasis and they, it, it, the way the uh, organism moves is they can move in any direction. They, they don't have any particular pathway and they can pass through even a closed anus. So because of the way they can migrate, it is easy for somebody to, uh, to contract amoebiasis uh, through oral genital contact. So in simple, in simple terms, it just shows to us what affects the genital area and affects the mouth. The, the similarity is, is very much obvious because of the type of lining that it, we that the both, uh, the, both the structures have. The lining of the mouth and the lining of the you know, uh, genital area are basically the same under the microscope. So whatever organism that can affect the mouth can affect the genital area. One other thing that we must bear in mind is that the Surgeon General in the United States established a few years ago a direct correlation between oral health and systemic health. So now you know whatever goes on in the mouth, uh, you know, can affect every aspect, every system of the body. So if somebody contracts uh, syphilis in the mouth, uh, guess what is going to happen? The, the, the syphilis, if it's not well treated, we go into the bloodstream and will go right to the brain and will cause all kinds of havoc in the tertiary syphilis. Um, another thing that we need to bear in mind when we talk about uh, oral sex is the propensity to develop uh, throat infections. Now, for those who practice uh, the oral sex, I'm talking about male, to female, male to male, uh, and they have the, uh, the, the, the decision to go deep in the throat of uh, their partner, what normally will happen is, if the partner has gonorrhea, for instance, or chlamydia, and uh, the semen goes into the throat, the throat can become infected right away. And then most people would not even suspect that it could be, you know, uh, uh, related to, uh, uh, you know, sexually transmitted disease. They just feel they have hoarseness. They think uh, it is too dry. They think they are dehydrated. They will look for every other thing except thinking about the, pos the possibility of having, a, a back, you know, um, a sexually transmitted disease in their throat. If it goes through the larynx, which means the semen could seep either directly or indirectly through the laryngeal opening, which we call the vocal cord area. If it goes 
down into the lining of the airway and also goes all the way down to the lungs, it may develop, you know, uh, um, gonorrhea in the lungs. And they will just be coughing, they will have they will have fever, they will have everything just like pneumonia, but most of the time they, it will not be suspected that they have gonorrhea in the lungs. But as a pathologist, I've, I've seen cases where we, after we did the autopsies and dissect, you know, and then did the sections of the lungs, and we found, why, why, how could gonorrhea be here? Uh, and we initially, it was very difficult to, to tie it together, like uh, gonorrhea is not transmitted through the blood. How did it get to the lungs? I mean, is this, is, this is not a nosocomial type of infection, so how does it get here? Well, it's only when we try to walk backwards that we try to see, well, the only other of, of, you know, explanation would be if it's a male transmitting it to, a, you know, whether to another male or to a female uh, via the oral sex, I mean, or, oral genital contact. So how about somebody who has TB and doesn't even know it? Because a lot of people that have, uh, you know, uh, immunodeficiency uh, do carry and do become uh, carriers of uh, tuberculosis. And some of them have open tuberculosis, which means when they cough and they bring out sputum, if you test their sputum, you will see the uh, mycobacteria organism in their sputum, which means if somebody, their partner has ulcer. Uh, in their genital area or in their mouth, and they either kiss or have oral genital contact, they may transmit the TB. So they, even though we talk about TB being airborne disease, they remember once it's already available in the body fluid, it will do the same damage, uh, particularly if you have ulcer. Uh, I've seen many cases of uh, TB in the mouth, uh, initially, we never recognized them as TB until we, do, we, we did biopsies of the, uh, the ulcer because it's a non-healing ulcer. Just like uh, uh, syphilis, they are non-healing ulcers. They stay there for a long period of time. And then when you know that an ulcer should heal within 10 days, and it doesn't heal within 10 days, you know it's an abnormal ulcer. You have to suspect the kind of organisms that are not common uh, commonly infecting the mouth, or that the individual has cancer of their mouth. So these are some of the things that we need to be aware of. Um, I hope my presentation has uh, uh, removed some myths about the topic. And then if you have any questions, I'll be glad to uh, interact with you on you know, dialogue on your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> you kept saying someone. That was me, right? <laughs> but, okay. Madam, Madam VP, ma. Madam Lara, you can unmute, ma. There yeah, you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, this wonderful information, uh, Dr. Ajagwe. Uh, when it comes to the children, we probably have little or no control. We can only pray. Nevertheless, I'd like to know, is any of this thing uh, uh, contractable by using a common restroom? Because, you know, like at the airport, in the airplane, uh, uh, at the park, you know, common restaurants. Well, that's a very interesting question. See, I laughed, right? Because that yeah. was always a, an excuse in the past. Uh, when we, you know, I remember very early when we would see a patient that had, uh, you know, gonorrhea and then uh, particularly female. And I say, oh, I, I didn't do nothing. I mean, maybe I contracted it from the toilet. Uh, well, we'll know definitely uh, the way you use the toilet does not expose you to contracting uh, gonorrhea in the toilet. Now, if you have big ulcer in your butt, I mean, not you, I'm sorry. No, I'm not addressing you, the questioner. Uh, if somebody has a big ulcer and they're behind and they're sitting on 
you can. A dirty you toilet. Can. No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about gonorrhea. I'm just talking about... All of it. General... All of it. You don't contract yeah. sexually transmitted diseases on the commode. Madam VP, your question. Yeah, I understand. Are they yeah. Are they Sorry, I, I'm trying to separate something. Infections okay. can still be transmitted from dirty commode. However, but it will not be sexually transmitted. transmitted disease that requires intimate contact and exchange of body fluids. Thank you. So it's, an, it's a very important question. It's an excellent question because it's a question that is asked a lot. And I have diagnosed, um, especially women, with sexually transmitted diseases, and they would tell me, oh, it must be from the commode. And I have to educate them that, no, you cannot get any of these sexually transmitted diseases on the commode. Auntie Tower, go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, um, good evening Dr. Ajabi and Dr. O, good evening. Um, my question is about Epi Simplex, because when we are growing, mm -hmm. some of our mates, they have it at the corner of their uh, mouth mm -hmm. and everything. Is that the only source is from sexual something or, or is just the illness? Well, that is the type one. The type one is usually in the mouth. It is not contracted through sex. But what I said when I was presenting it, if somebody already has herpes simplex of their mouth and they, are, they have sexual contact with somebody in their genital area, and that person has ulcer or tear or cut in their genital area, the chance of course contamination is very high. So if you found vesicles, like those tiny vesicles in the genital area, the chance, and it's for, and you know it's because, I mean, and the person knows that it's from their partner who had it in the mouth. If that would not be diagnosed immediately as type two, because it's in the genital area. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It will be diagnosed based on the, on the uh, histology, because there is the immunocytochemistry that can actually diagnose the two. If you have them similar, you take specimen from both and you put it on, you know, subject them to specific immunocytochemistry, it will tell you which one you are dealing with. So type one is always in the mouth or in the face because sometimes you can see it in the nose. And like I said, if you have it here, you rub your eye, after touching it, you can spread it to the eye. Actually, if you have a skin tear, on your finger, uh, okay. If you have a tear on your finger, like a skin tag, and you, you tear it off and then you touch it, there is what we call the herpetic wicklow. No, so no. people can get wicklow from you know, touching their own herpes with their own fingers. So you can self-inoculate, you can self-infect. Uh, if you are not very careful, um, with all those uh, type of infections. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajagbe. Um, let, me, let me break this down, Auntie Tawa, Ma. Um, traditionally, like Dr. Ajagbe said, type 1 herpes is herpes that we find, you know, around the lips, even around the nose rails sometimes, on the nose, uh, above the lip, you know, around there. Um, it's cold sore. Another name for it is cold sore. But because of the sexual practices that are occurring now, like the oral sex that I just talked about, we now see in type one in the genital area. You can tell by looking, um, and it's, the, it's still painful anywhere it is. Uh, so until testing is done, you know, with all the big names he said, I don't like to use the scientific names of us like this, then one can tell if it is type one or type two. The type two 
traditionally used to be in the genital area. Now we're seeing it in the mouth. So sexual practices have caused things to be, you know, uh, that's why we're having this conversation. That's why Dr. Jagwe felt it was important. And, you know, uh, not by coincidence, I was talking to a pastor just before Medical Mondays tonight, and he was telling me that, oh, he saw a topic that is very important because people ask that in conferences in churches, but they will write it down. They don't want to know who is asking the question and all, and that these are things that needs to be discussed because of those practices that people have, things have changed some. And I think Dr. Aluya, who is, uh, who, he has, he wears two hats, treats adults, treats children, I think would have, you know, input also in this. Uh, Dr. Luya, when you're ready, please, if you have an input, let me know. But I want to say something about syphilis. We see syphilis, um, thank God, it's not as rampant as I used to see them. I still see them, you know, every now and then. Uh, but with syphilis, it's a dangerous, dangerous infection because the, the sore that people have is not painful like the herpes sore. Herpes is painful. Syphilitic sore is not. We call it shanka, and it will be there. And without treatment, it goes away if you don't do anything. But then that's the primary syphilis. Then the secondary would follow if no treatment occurred, if that person did not go to see a doctor to say, look, I have this sore. It's not painful, but it's been there. If they don't do that and it's cultured, for us to know and treat it. The treatment is easy uh, and treat it. Then they will develop secondary syphilis at some point, which is rash. And um, syphilitic rash can occur, it usually occurs you know, in the hands and the feet, it's peculiar. But I've seen syphilitic rash that does not occur even in the hands, but it's just rash. And if you're not thinking about it, you won't know. Without treatment, that one will go away too. And then, it could take 20 years later, the tertiary syphilis will now occur that Dr. Jagwe described. It's a scary thing. At that point, there isn't much we can do. So testing, checking is very important. For me, for my patient's physical exam, I check everything. It's not lack of trust. It is, you know, just being proactive. If there is something, we can still treat it then and we'll clear it. And, but you know, if you don't know, then it becomes a problem. These things can be huge. Um, I, I, had, I had an experience that I have to share. I had a patient come in who complained of sore throat. And the natural thing I decided to, you know, have one of our staff members do a rapid strep culture to see if the person has strep throat. And that was negative. He didn't have strep throat. He was a guy. He didn't have strep throat. So I decided to, you know, ask them to do another culture, another swap, another. send it out for gonorrhea chlamydia. He came back positive for chlamydia. And it was after that chlamydia test positive that he now told me he's engaged in oral sex and that is exactly who he got it from. So oh, oh, these things are real, real and we need to be careful. Um, um, Dr. Louis, if you have a comment, please jump in, but have some questions. Dr. Jagwe, Dr. this is a question that I don't know if it's a trick question, a joke question, and I don't know why. Um, well, Dr. Dr. O, um, good evening, everybody. <laughs> good evening. Pretty interesting topic. Uh, like you said, it's something that we needed to talk about uh, because it's real and these things happen um, all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in my capacity where I am right now, we had a girl who's 17 who was positive, you know, the OBD1 screen, it was positive for trachomonas, positive for chlamydia, positive for, for, for gonorrhea. So all of those triple. And that's a 17-year-old. Um, they're young, 
the impetus, the uh, began to the hormones as are charging up. So, and if it's uncontrolled, uncultured, then it leads to stuff. But the good thing is she's lucky that uh, she doesn't have HIV because once you begin to get, you know, one or the other of the, the uh, those three, the chances of you getting HIV is very high as well. Uh, but um, so, you know, she's treated, but again, the, one of the things that, you know, before I go into any other thing that we're gonna talk about, uh, one of the things we need to understand that any of these sexually transmitted diseases are reportable. Meaning if it's positive, at least in my state, I think it's the same thing everywhere in the whole United States. Once it's positive, the state gets to know about it and it's on their database uh, and it's kept. And that's one story that can lead, you know, to something else. We've had stories or reports of things that are happening everywhere. So uh, these are reportable um, infections. The reason why, because they want to do contact tracing so that they make sure that, uh, you know, whoever gets it and the contact that they have also get treated properly. So in the case of this young lady, uh, we trace the contact and the boyfriend has to be treated as well. Now, if the boyfriend is not treated, then it becomes an issue because she can reinfect, be reinfected again. Uh, so that's why it's important uh, to sit and educate these young, you know, uh, individuals and let them know that, oh, this is what you have, but your boyfriend, whoever you've been with, uh, needs to be tre uh, treated as well and needs to be screened. Uh, sometimes you can offer them the treatment yourself. They'll come see you as a patient or you just tell them to go see their doctor so that they can get treated. Um, one of the other things that are really important and people tend to forget is that in as much as these things are prevalent, um, but at the same time, they are very treatable. Uh, we have, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, CDC guidelines for treating gonorrhea, uh, chlamydia, uh, trichomonas, and, and, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, HIV now. In fact, we not just have the, the tablets, we also have, uh, if I, let me go back a little bit on the HIV one. I remember when David Ho. Well, uh, I think that's was what I do. We have one <laughs> yeah. people a day now. All right, but then Many of we them. actually have the injections. The yeah, we do, we do. Right, yeah. so twice a year injections. And there's some injection that I'm actually working on that is once a year. And they're actually doing the research. You are muted. So. So that HIV will be yes, chance. And um, and it will be in fact HIV is actually now a chronic disease. Sorry, kept on coming. Um, so um so these are some of the things that you know I know you know the good doctor had just talked so much about it extensively. Uh, and you were mentioning uh, syphilis. Syphilis again. There's also the other component of which is latent syphilis, meaning in your body in between the stages, usually between stage two and three. And the three can last up to 30 years. Uh, and where it begins to form lesions in the brain called gumas, and those are where they're called neurosyphilis. And it can be really dangerous. But in between, you can get uh, um, injection, uh, penicillin, G, uh, you know, three mega units, you give the shot, you know, every, you know, two weeks for three every, shots every and you're week, good. Every week. Every week, well, every week for three weeks, three shots and you're done and it's good. And then you do a treatment, uh, uh, what do you call it, a test of treatment, uh, confirming whether it's uh, syphilis been treated or the other one. But in terms of syphilis, sometimes uh, the um, RPR that they use in screening for it is also positive for other infections because like the doctor said, it's a spiral kit and sometimes we have other spiral kits um, uh, that can actually cause those things as well. Uh, so uh, when we screen those things, we tend to do the FTAB with the uh, fluorescent antibodies, uh, troponema antibodies, he says, to really confirm if it is and we also do the VDRL. Uh, these are confirmatory tests so that you know exactly what it is before you begin to treat. Um, in terms of, and, and me wearing my pediatric hat now, and he talked about, you know, a, a child coming in with uh, infection, you know, 
barely treated and you know most pediatrician will not even remember uh, that uh, it's an infectious disease and all that and all that i'll tell you this if it's positive that a child has chlamydia or gonorrhea that child has been sexually molested period and that's how we look at it in pediatrics so if a child comes and is positive even orally then there's no way on earth that a child will get any of those infections. So it's that child is sexually infected and sexually molested, and that is uh, a trigger for uh, further investigation and evaluation. So that's that. Because again, on the long run, it can also result in emotional stress and trauma and things you know that will spread out down down the road. Now on the triple antibody, the triple box we talked about, trachomonas, chlamydia, and all that. Like in the case of this young girl, um, what are the long-term you know, effects if it's not treated? Uh, you can have abscesses uh, formed. You can have uh, uh, long-term effects where you know, a cyst or whatever have been formed. And to a point where you can have the fallotium tubes you know, totally destroyed. That the sense that down the road, it becomes really difficult for that female uh, to conceive because the fallopian tubes are tiny as they are get destroyed. And for those, even if they do get pregnant, they may, they're very prone to atopic pregnancies. So those are the issues that uh, we tend to uh, face as well. Uh, there's disseminated gonorrhea, which can present in diffuse joint swelling and aches and pain. Unless you screen and have a, a, a history, you will not know it. Now, um, I think recently the, 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 the nomenclature was STDs, which is described, and then STIs. There's a little bit of uh, the STI now include uh, Candida, you know, Candida. Uh, and there are different kinds of Candida. Candida African, which is the one we usually know uh, uh, that causes the yeast and all that. And then there's Candida glabrata now, and a few other species as well. The glabrata one is the one that usually will not give you the cheese white discharge. It may give you a little white discharge, uh, but it also gives you the itching, provert itching that comes with it. So, um, and it can't be sexually transmitted, or maybe it, maybe it, it may not be sexually transmitted, but there's a cross contamination between one man and a woman. I've had these incidences where a man gets it, gives it to the wife, uh, and then, you know, she starts itching and all that. If you screen, you get the, get get a positive. So you need to treat both both of them at the same time. So these are some of the little things that uh, that happen. Now coming back to HIV, uh, there's a whole lot of dimensions. You know, with everything else, we need to as we grow and and change in the character and everything else. Viruses and bacteria do the same thing as well. Um, the pattern of which these viruses change over time. There are some viruses as we look now. They're all old viruses, just like the the flu virus that came in 100 years ago. The species are so much older now, we begin to see COVID uh, that begin to really get really old as well. We see the different species that are coming in, you know, from the novel, novel uh, what do you call it, um, type uh, into the Omicron and all the other ones that will come subsequently. So the same thing with viruses uh, and HIV as well. So that one of the things with the pattern we're seeing here, uh, initially was one time, Elderly people were getting HIV, elderly, 70, 80 years old, you know, and one of the early signs of presentation will be, uh, what do you call it, Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy can be an early sign of viral infection, even HIV in the elderly. So if you see anybody who comes with Bell's palsy as elderly, screen them for HIV as well. We began to find out that here, uh, at least in the Northeast, we're having a whole lot. So, but the investigation went into play, and we we'll found out that oh, that uh, during the end of the month, a lot of these young girls where they got desperate, were not going to nursing homes and uh, giving services to some of these nursing home people and collecting their paycheck. <laughs> so, and in the process, giving these elderly people HIV. So, that's where population health and contact tracing come into place. Now, and that's why they banned people from going to, especially people who are not family members from going to a nursing home. You know, these things happen. And what we'll begin to also see uh, at one time as well 
that younger and younger, younger girls were getting HIV. So we're wondering, ah, why? You know, and they don't know it. The only time we find out is usually when they get pregnant. And of course, every female who's pregnant gets screened for HIV. They get positive. And they're like, ah, what happened? Oh, they had one boyfriend, you know, one or two or so. And they begin to screen and contact. Realize that some of these young boys were actually... Now, what, what, what created the, the intriguing investigation was that what? Once you get this virus, you analyze the virus and do the strain. They found out that these virus were old viruses, old HIV viruses, long, meaning the virus has been here for over 20, 30 years. We can tell those things because we know the mutations and the areas that these things take place. So they got to look even more. Why are young boys getting HIV with old viruses? They now realize that a lot of these young boys um, were actually going to areas and prostituting, collect money from certain areas. They don't call themselves gay. They, they don't say they're gay. They just, they just you know, they, they, they don't think they're bisexual, but they were prostituting and collecting money and coming back to impress some of these young girls and the process giving them HIV. So these things happen. And these are population health uh, um, things that we, we pursue and look into critically so that we know the root cause of anything, and then put a stem to it. Uh, and But the most important thing is actually, again, educating, educating, educating. So we must educate each other uh, about these things and educate our family and, and, and children as well. Because if your children are good and everything, you never can tell who they're hanging out with. You know, And that's where um, a topic like this is important so that we can bring it up to the open and educate our, our community and we all be, be well informed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for always okay. wearing that adult pediatric hat. Thank you. Let me, let me just quickly address one thing. Um, Dr. Aluya, if you presume on knowing that um, a child that presents with STI has been molested, uh, you may be missing the point you know, of some data that's have been, that have been showing that the, the uh, oral sex sexual practices among adolescents is pretty high. They don't even have to have been molested by anybody. They are doing it among themselves, but when they have multiple partners, among which they may have uh, others, you know, I mean, adults contacting them, just like you have explained, that uh, some of them are prostituting themselves and they still go and have uh, oral sex with young, you know, their own age mates. There is that, uh, you know, complexity that must always be addressed. Um, if every child that presents with STI is being molested, then um, you would not be agreeing with the data that is available. Um, I think when he said child, we're talking about two, three. We're not talking about right. We're not talking about teenagers. Well, or year old. About He's centers. not teenagers. No. <laughs> well, we, is it, when you define oh, child. child, we're talking about a child, not child. It's a totally yeah. different story. So, um, and that's why, and this, these are not my data. These are data that are standard. And these are facts, you know, we, even from the American CDC, um, American Academy of Pediatrics. From our standpoint, when we see children, when we say child, we're talking about those young ones, not the teenage years. They're not there yet. And when we see that, yes, it is abuse, abuse, abuse. We call social services. We do our best to protect that child. So it's, it's not the teenage years. Of course, what you, what you presented and what you were saying, um, teenagers engage a lot in oral sex thinking like you rightfully just shared with us that it is safe and it is not. Yeah, but children are different. So I was going to ask this question and I thought, you know, I started before Dr. Jagwe saying that, you know, I don't know if this was a trick question. I don't know what kind of question this was, but, you know, I had the opportunity as Dr. Aluya was speaking to get some more light to, to have some light shed into it. It reads, 
Can you get an STD from licking a commode or toilet or even kissing a commode or toilet? So uh, before you answer, if father now says that, um, this is a serious question. A few years ago, young people were performing challenges on TikTok, a popular social media app where they were leaking toilet bowls on airplanes. And I'm going to post, <laughs> I'm going to post this in the forum in case anybody is interested in, you know, just cross-checking and, and seeing that. So Dr. Jagbe, can you answer that question, sir? Well, I mean, uh, people can engage in all kinds of risky behaviors, uh, either by daring one another to do stuff that are inconvenient. Uh, and they, they actually taking the risk that they, they may not be able to uh, contain. Well, the, 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 the direct question is, can one contract STI from, com from leaking a commode. The only, if let's say for instance, somebody that just used a toilet before, the person went there actually has a gonorrhea discharge, you know, had pus. And you see it there and you want to leak it, there's a problem with that, men you know, the, the, men the mental process going on in the head of that individual. Now, if you see it as, as pause and you leak it, the chance of you contacting uh, H, I mean, uh, the bacteria, the Neisseria gonorrhea from that is very high, if you, particularly if you have ulcer in your mouth. Now, it may not present exactly the same way that it will present in the genital, but the bacteria infection of any open skin or mucosa is still a theoretical and probably a practical, you know, uh, situation that can be verified. So um, I don't know if there was any longitudinal study about those people who did that leaking of the toilets in the uh, on the plane, and what, what what their situation was before they did it, and uh, empirically tested afterwards. So I wouldn't be quick to say that it cannot happen. Neither will I quick, quickly say that, well, definitely you can contract uh, STI from leaking kumon. So, you know, in follow-up to that, said, consider this scenario. Young person leaks toilet, contracts an STD. Law enforcement assumes they were sexually assaulted. And this writer, this person asking this question is making a great point, which is the point you have made before, you know, uh, Teenage person, because these are most likely teenagers or, you know, I don't know, young adults doing this uh, on the airplanes on TikTok. And, you know, of course, showing it to the world. I, I put the link up there. So just imagine, you know, they say, you know, I didn't have sex with anyone, but then contract something and they assume, you know, it's abuse. Of course, it's not abuse, like you said, if they're teenagers. Um, it could be oral sex, it could be something ludicrous like this. But you, you also realize that most of these are self-reports. If they are self-reports, which means whatever they say they did is what they did, apart from- No, what it's was on actual. TikTok. So no, 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 it's... I'm saying before. Okay. If they say, oh, they never engage in sex before, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. You don't know that they are telling the truth. But, you know, if all they want to try to prove is that, oh, yes, I didn't have sex last night, so I leaked the toilet, I have STD. Maybe they had ST, they already had sex. Even the so-called non, uh, uh, unprotected sex, long before then, which has exposed them to that thing and it's already incubating. And then they just look for an excuse to say, well, See, I'm very pure. I never had sex before. Now look at me. All I got, I could, I actually contracted a, a, an infection from leaking the commode. The, I think there's a that's there's, there's something suspicious about that whole uh, plot. That okay, let's see what happens when we leak the toilet on a plane. 
why not on the uh, on the subway toilet where the, the the cleaners don't come you know uh, regularly to keep the place clean why don't they go do that on uh, on rest stops when they are driving uh, uh, you know long distance and see whether it's the same thing well, I'm just saying that it doesn't, it, it makes some interesting sen scenario, this whole deal. Um, no, I mean, if I may add to that, she she's one of those very crazy, crazy young girls uh, who has supposedly <laughs> some uh, social mental issues and all they just want is more likes on TikTok and whatever. And like I say, it's what the Corona, coronavirus challenge, you know, the people create challenges just to cause vibes and get likes and so that it can get money. Uh, and like she had said, um, um, that that was uh, a toilet seat of a sugar daddy's private jet. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was a toilet seat of a sugar daddy's private jet. So you can imagine the kind of person she is, you understand? And they just do crazy things just to, you know, yeah. uh, spend, point of ridiculousness so that's that's what it is you know but outside of that one of the things i wanted to say is this um and, and for um other issues when it comes to you know because we're moving if you look at the, the western world the biggest problem that they have is non-infectious disease uh but in developing world it's still infectious disease now, as you develop and uh, your socioeconomic status improves, uh, of course, you know, your hygiene and everything has improved, and then you begin to move from infectious to non-infectious as well. But one of the biggest concern or the risk that people begin to really talk about here in the US in the future is to look out for hepatitis C. Hepatitis C, for some reason, they just, they just feel it's gonna blow out of, out, of, out of space. And it's a whole lot of big issue. In the sense that, thank God, we have means of managing hepatitis C now um, with a tablet. Before, it was the immunoglobulin that they used to use to treat it. And it was such a interferon, dangerous... Interferon, yes, interferon. Yeah, interferon. interferon right. Yeah. right. So they, that's what they were using to treat it then. Uh, but then a lot of people were going crazy. Depression was taking place, hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism. But thank God for for the treatment that way they came up with, with tablets um, to do that. But the, you know, I'll, I'll shift a little bit so that, so one of the reasons why we're here is to advocate for ourselves and, and so that we be at the table and also uh, uh, partake in the process. Now, surprisingly, that drug that was used to treat, that we're now used to treat hepatitis C was actually first tested in East Africa. And when they did that, uh, on, because they have a huge number of hepatitis C around the East Africa, North Africa area, especially Egypt. Egypt has some of the highest in the world, as a matter of fact. So, but they did, and the cure rate was so good that they stopped the drug immediately. Came here, patented it, and put it $30,000 per, per treatment a month, $30,000. But the irony is this, Oh no! It, start, the... it started with eighty thousand. It's down. Now. Uh, well, okay. Well, you that, know, I tell you, know, you that's you know, what they did. You know, I treat, you know, I treat this thing. <laughs> right. So, but well, that's what they did when they started. They came and paid and put it thirty thousand dollars. Now, our people who they tested this thing on back home, what did they do for them? And that's a question I kept on asking them all the time. Who cares? Nobody cares. But that's the same way. But one of the things we need to know that hepatitis C is almost 300 times as effective as HIV, 300 times. And that's one thing we need to know. And how can you get it from the blood? So the, the, the teaching was, if you put a drop of HIV on the table and hepatitis B, uh, C on the table and dilute it 30 times, both, and you inject one or the other one, you will still most likely get uh, hepatitis C because it lasts longer on the surface. HIV does not, it dies early. If you dilute it, you can't get it. So that's how dangerous hepatitis C is. Now, on my world, um, because as a standard, I always screen everybody when they come in, HIV, hepatitis C, and all that. And a lot of people will be surprised. Like, Doc, I have hepatitis C? I said, yes. Like, oh, my God, how? I don't know. 
I haven't, you know, some of them never did drugs. The, the last time they're like, oh, I did drugs 30 years ago. You know, or some of them who've been in jail. Now the irony is this, they never did drugs. What they did was chasing the dragon. You know what chasing the dragon is? So chasing the dragon back in the days is when you put cocaine on a, on a foil and then you light the foil up and it, it, it uh, uh, what do you call it? It uh, flourishes, it turns into a mist and you use the straw and then sniff, sniff it. That's what's called chasing the dragon. Tell me how I know these things. <laughs> but that's how, that's how it is. So when they, they, the individual used the straw, inhaled the smoke, and then a little drop stays on that small straw, and they pass it to one another. That small straw alone, with a tiny amount of blood, you pass it to somebody with hep C, that person is catching hep C. So that's how a lot of people caught it way back then, as a matter of fact. So other than you know, uh, the drug. So as we speak, um, it's important again that we begin to share this information so that our community will know this. And if the family history of someone with hep C is not to ostracize them, whatever, then send them to the nearest <coughs> doctor who will take care of them and they get medications and they all be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, Dr. Aluya, hepatitis C, before we got the uh, one of the drugs, you know, we were loving for past that matter to pay attention to hepatitis C because it was gonna be the next epidemic. Tattoos are a big one. So, oh, I never use drugs and all of that. You know, <coughs> tattoo colors used to not change the ink sometimes because especially the colored ones that are expensive, they change the needles. The needles are always new ones brought out of a pocket, but the ink, there may be ink left over from the last person they tattooed and they add more ink to save ink. Or what if what is left is a lot, they pour it into a big jar of what is left. And if that person they tattooed last that they kept the blood, the, the, the ink, blood is in there because if you if you know how they tattoo, you know, they put the needle in the in the area, put it in the ink, put it back. So you're transmitting blood to ink and back and forth. So they 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 contaminate that whole ink and anyone they tattoo with it for the next week because hepatitis B and C last a whole week alive. For the next week, everyone they tattoo with it will get that virus, hepatitis C, sometimes B. Now, not only that, like Dr. Luya said, HIV virus lasts like 15 minutes outside of the body. So when it's not in the body, 15 minutes is dead, but hepatitis B, hepatitis C, they last a week. Cocaine also, there's another way they got infected when they sniff it. They say, I never use IV drugs. Yes, you never did. But when they sniff and they share the cocaine, you know, it bruises the nostrils. And when they take, put their finger in, put it back, they transmit blood into that cocaine. Anyone sharing with them um, will be infected if they have hepatitis C. So, and people can say, oh, I don't use drugs at all. But please, if you're getting tattoo, stop. We need to educate our children. It leads me to this next question. Auntie Susan says, Dr. Jagwe, thank you for the thorough analysis of this very mind boggling topic. God save us. Amen. She says, how do we advise our children and grandchildren about how to prevent these diseases? Okay, well, um, first of all, you know, the, the topic should not be a, a source of embarrassment at home to discuss. It, you have to maintain a balance between not becoming too overly explicit to make children become curious that they want to try it and still thinking that they're invincible, that they could do it and nothing will happen to them. Uh, I think it requires wisdom and it requires understanding of the content that needs to be shared. Awareness is important. We cannot shy away from that. Uh, sometimes we don't even know what our, you know, our children have been exposed to because they have, they have freedom with uh, electronics. 
uh, even if you have restriction at home, they have exposure to it in school. And many of the sites that they have access to, the only question they have to answer is, are you 18 years? If they can't, they have to lie. Most of them will do that and lie to get the content they are looking for. So if you can um, have impact on the, on the uh, children or the grandchildren uh, long before they become exposed to this, it may be very important that they will be telling you or asking you for input. Oh, mommy, I want to check something out. What does this mean if they've had it from somewhere? And then you should be able to explain to them in the language they can understand. Uh, not shiny, we don't say, no, 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 stop. Who's that? Why, where did you hear that? Don't even say stuff like that anymore. And the child's wondering, what did I do wrong? I want to know. Because if we don't tell them, they will find out from their peers. And what they will find out from their peers is not going to be exactly what we will be able to present to them in a balanced form. Uh, most of the time, the, ch the, the children will dare one another. Uh, you know, I dare you. Uh, chicken, 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 you can do it. Ooh, look at you. And then they make, they embarrass one another. They want to stand deep. They, they want to be different. So it's only at home that we can make our children and grandchildren to become comfortable with who they are. That they don't have to conform to what their peers are pressuring them to do in order for them to conform. So um, I think the parents, oh, we as parents and grandparents, we owe it to ourselves to be knowledgeable first about the topics and then be able to share it in the age appropriate you know, way or manner so that they can learn and be able to uh, use the information we pass on to them. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for that depth. And Susan also asked, is there a general test that could be done to determine if an individual has any of these viruses um, during the physicals? And I would answer that, yes, ma'am, the viruses and the bacteria, we do have testings for uh, HIV, syphilis, uh, hepatitis, A, B, C, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, um, candida that has been you know, added to sexually transmitted diseases, and now it's called sexually transmitted infections, ST, STIs instead of STDs. We have testings for all of them. And you know, even HPV, we have um, human papilloma virus. Right. Now, go ahead, sir. No, no, I'm agreeing with, I said, right, that yeah. there, are, there are tests for those too. Yes, so we do pap smears in, in women, you know, there's anal, anal um, pap smear that is also done in uh, men having sex with men uh, to, to test for uh, human papilloma virus, because this is a virus that actually, there are strains of that virus that will become cancerous, will become yeah. cancer if not caught on time and treated. So we do have testings. And that's what Dr. Aluya and I alluded to. He does testings on all his patients. I do it too. I take every opportunity to, you know, just do all these testings um, so that we can diagnose early and be able to treat because we can treat all of them. Even hepatitis B that does not have a cure, we have treatment to suppress the virus now. And you know, Dr. Luya mentioned hepatitis. Dr. Jagwe, you mentioned hepatitis too. In, Dr. Jagwe talked about hepatitis A because it is oral fecal area that you get that from. It is not, you know, but now people are getting it from oral sex. Initially in the past, we used to say it is not sexually transmitted. You know, we have to redefine that. So hepatitis B and C though, especially they, if, if not treated and they, they are chronic, they eventually would cause the liver, the liver disease to shrivel and to become cancer. Liver cancer is not a pretty thing. Once that happens, it's bad news. So these things are very important from sexually transmitted disease to now cancer. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Jagwe, for this uh, topic. I cannot take credit for it. In fact, I'm the one he's been alluding to um, every now and then that when he came up with the topic, some people raised their elbows and said, what? What are you talking about? We're going to talk about this on Medical Mondays with Dr. Owell. Um, thank you so much for bringing this book up. It's very important. Um, Auntie Tower, go ahead, ma'am. You can unmute. You are, you're still muted. Please unmute. There you go. All these tests that we're talking about, are they going to be individual tests or are they going to be packed like in three places, the bacterial, the virus, or are they going to do all the tests? Excellent question. So the HIV, syphilis, hepatitis, we, we have a panel for the hepatitis that will check everything. It's blood. Okay. So when we draw the blood and we check in for things like the sugar level, cholesterol, um, you know, calcium, potassium, all of those things, you know, same, we draw blood and, you know, they will be in different tubes to, um, to test for those. The gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, trichomonas, urine, and I also add mycoplasma is, you know, that's another one that hardly anybody talks about. I check it, I mm. test it. Mycoplasma and that's urine, urine test. Is, and like I said, do, they, can, do you use swabs for those ones? That no, you urine. Them? We collect the urine and send it to the lab. Hmm. The lab does all of these testings, yes. Usually the lab will spin the urine. Down. Okay. They will spin it down and then use the deposit and use, uh, they use it to plate the agar and then that's how they culture most of those um, bacterial organisms. And if they are suspecting amoebic, amoebic organism, they will also use the, the appropriate agar to do that, to culture that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Um, if anyone has any question, they still have the opportunity to ask for a few minutes. Uh, but if not, I just want to say that this has been, you know, an awesome conversation. I have learned from it. I, I appreciate the fact that we have this forum where we can bring conversations that are tough and um, address them in order to protect us, um, in order for us to learn more and to better ourselves, to better our health. Um, education is power. Knowledge is power. So when we learn, then we can know how to, um, to prevent, to shield, and to live healthier. And uh, the Lord has made us healthy people already. You know, uh, we have so much advantage uh, having this dark skin. And I just, uh, I'm hoping that we will continue to learn different things to help to continue to better us. So it's Thanksgiving on Thursday, and this is amazing that we still have so many people on the platform tonight that is Thanksgiving week. People are out shopping and, you know, getting ready for Thanksgiving. Um, I'm looking forward to those turkeys and um, <laughs> the things I don't eat and the hams and all that I won't touch, but look and, and enjoy the beauty of them. The briskets that I don't eat, but to look and, you know, just see how pretty they look or how nice they look. Anyways, uh, while we're doing all of that, I want to encourage us to please remain safe. Coronavirus is still rampaging. Um, flu is out there. And for the children, the RSV is also there. Are three major viruses. When Dr. Aluya said, oh, the coronavirus was old. And, you know, now, you know, we have these uh, mutations and the ones to come. I cringed because that was a statement of fact. But I cringed because we don't know um, what tomorrow holds. We don't know what would happen. So I want to encourage all of us to please be safe. 
during this holiday season, but we enjoy each other. Let us praise God for another year. This time of year is always an exciting time for me. Gobble, gobble, gobble. See you later. <laughs> See you. Man. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy uh, Thanksgiving to everyone. Join. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you, Dr. O. Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving, Bye. all. Thank you. you.